The event on each side of Vancouver, British Columbia is one of the world's ground zeros for addiction in that in a few square block radius we have thousands of people injecting, inhaling and ingesting drugs of all kinds and paying dearly for it. These people are often outside the law, certainly beset by many medical problems due to injection drug use including psychosis, including HIV, including hepatitis C, cancers, they die of overdoses. This is trench warfare and the people that are the frontline soldiers dying from it are the people affected by addiction. So that's where I worked for 12 years. And um, what I learned could be summed up really very uh, briefly by saying that addiction is not a choice that anybody makes, it's not a moral failure, it's not an ethical lapse, it's not a weakness of character. It's not a failure of will, which is how our society depicts addiction, nor is it an inherited brain disease, which is how the medical tendency is to see it. What it actually is, it's a response to human suffering. And all these people that I worked with had been severely traumatized as children. All the women had been sexually abused. All the men had been uh, traumatized, some of them sexually, physically, emotionally neglected. and. Not only is that my perspective, it's also what the scientific and research literature shows. So addiction then is actually, rather than being a disease as such or a human choice, it actually is it's an attempt to escape suffering temporarily. By the time I, I went to work there, I had already been in family practice for 20 years. I'd seen a lot and I was quite attuned to the impact of early childhood experiences on adult psychology and adult brain physiology. But I just hadn't seen the depth and the degree until I went to work down there. So really it dramatized and confirmed for me, made it very palpable how addictions are a response to suffering and that what people need in response to addiction is not judgment and not simply symptom control. They need to be helped to heal from their trauma because it is all about trauma. The media, the television, cultural depiction of addicts is usually as desperate people but without showing why they're desperate. So all the shows is the desperation for the drugs. Uh, there's no indication of what's driving that desperation. And hence you see them behaving in all kinds of dysfunctional ways. Aggressive or manipulative or uh, unpleasant. But again, there's no three-dimensional sense of the reality of these people as to what that's really all about for them. Is it possible to cure people? You're speaking from the Western model where I am the expert and you're the one with the disease and I'm going to cure you uh, like you cure a piece of meat, you know. No. The answer to that question framed that way is no, it's not possible. If you're asking is it possible for people to heal from trauma sufficiently that they don't have to keep escaping into addictions to lessen the suffering of their trauma, yes, that's entirely possible. But the question is, under what conditions is that possible? And under the conditions that obtain in London, UK, or Vancouver, British Columbia, or in New York, New York, or any place, under the conditions that obtain socially, legally, and from the perspective of medical practice, it's hardly a likelihood because we're approaching it from the wrong direction and with the wrong perspective. If I could constantly demonstrate that with this particular population, I could affect a 5 or 10 percent success rate of getting people to leave their addictions behind, I'd be considered to be a genius because our results are so poor. When I say ours, I don't mean ours specifically in Vancouver, I don't mean that, I mean the overall treatment model for addiction is so poor in succeeding with the most affected segments of the population. So, I mean, addictions are like everything else on a spectrum. So a lot of people do heal from addictions, but the most inveterate, most entrenched addicts, they have the hardest time. And they're also the ones whom society gives the hardest time, so that it makes it even harder to help them. Never mind they don't get the help they need, they actually get actively punished. And so what you've actually got is traumatized children, and children are traumatized, that affects how they feel about themselves, which is deeply ashamed. Because a child always believes that it's about himself. So if, if I'm being hurt like this, I've got to be a terrible person. Or 
if I was sexually abused, why didn't I fight back? I must be a very weak person. So there's a deep sense of shame. Then there's tremendous emotional pain that accrues from abuse and neglect. Tremendous emotional pain that is hardly possible for people to bear. Now they have to soothe their pain with substances or other compulsive behaviors. Then the trauma itself, given that the human brain develops an interaction with the environment, shapes the brain circuitry in such a way that the person will be more likely to find relief from the drugs. So the very physiology of the brain is affected by early trauma. So then you take these traumatized people and you make their habit illegal. It's not illegal to drink yourself to death. It's not illegal to make yourself sick with emphysema or lung cancer by means of cigarettes. But it's illegal to use other substances. So now you take these abused, traumatized people, you place them outside the law, you put them in jails, and you hound them all their lives, treating them like criminals and bad people and, and failures and rejects and less than a human. And then we wonder how come they don't get better. So it's a self-perpetuating cycle of taking traumatized people and then re-traumatizing them and then hoping at the same time, why don't they listen? Why don't they get better already? Why don't they give it up? Well, they don't give it up because the more hurt they are, the more they need to escape. In other words, the addiction wasn't your problem. Your problem was that you had a lot of emotional pain, you didn't know what to do with. So the addiction was really an attempt to solve a problem. So when you say, why do people use substances or why do they engage in addictions in general? It's because they have a problem they don't know what to do with. And if you really understand their addiction, we have to ask, well, what gave you so much emotional pain? And how come you didn't have the internal resources? This is not a judgment, it's simply an inquiry. How come you lacked, at some point, the internal resources to deal with that pain in a more creative, forward-looking way that would help you resolve the pain rather than to perpetuate it? So really, really what it was is that the addiction came along to help you solve a problem you had no other solutions for at the time. And that's the case for all addictions. So why do people use? Why do people engage in addictions? Because they have deep emotional problems. They don't have the means to resolve on their own. That's why they use. The average medical student, until very recently, has never even heard the word trauma in their education. It doesn't show up. We don't talk about it. We don't talk about its impact on the brain, on the personality, on, on, on the emotional life of people, on its impact on people's physical health. It's not a word that we mention. We're traumaphobic. As a fellow doctor said to me, the medical profession is traumaphobic. Psychiatrists these days are trained mostly in this biological model of psychiatry where everything comes down to a biological brain disease. Here, let's give you a pill. The last thing most psychiatrists know how to talk about is actually emotional pain or its origins in human experience. You'd think they'd know how to do that, but they don't. They're not trained in it. It's not part of the predominant medical ideology. And, you know, as a physician, I can tell you, we like to think of medicals as a science, and it has certainly great scientific achievements uh, to its credit and great scientific insights to buttress its successes. But it's as much as ideology as a science. And ideology has certain hidden assumptions that are hidden from the people that believe in ideology. And so that if something is excluded by your ideology, you just won't see it. And so that you can be talking to somebody about your addiction, and the simple question, what did they do for you? And how come you're in so much emotional pain? It doesn't occur to anybody, you know, trained in the classical manner. Now, this is true not just for physicians, it's true for a lot of psychologists as well, who are more interested in solving your problems and getting you to overcome the behavior than in asking, well, okay, where does the behavior come from? And what are you still carrying inside that's making you behave that way? And how can we help you resolve what's inside you? Not just how do we help you change your behavior, but how do we help you change? Now that's what healing is, and that happens inside a person. So it's never a question of anybody curing anybody else, but we can guide people to healing if we ask the right questions.